Good evening, everyone. I'm Professor Barlow Dermagradichan of the Armenian Studies Program, and I would like to welcome you to this first presentation of the Spring 2022 Armenian Studies Program Lecture Series. After uh, tonight's presentation, you will have the, uh, the opportunity to ask our guests questions uh, through the chat area of Zoom. So please be aware of that and save your questions until the end, and then we'll be reading and, and talking uh, to him. I would also like to thank the Society for Armenian Studies, the SAS, for co-sponsoring uh, this evening's presentation. Before I introduce our guests and before we move on to our uh, program, I'd like to share with you uh, a little bit about a couple of the upcoming events uh, organized by the Armenian Studies Program. Actually, that's not what I wanted to share. Let me uh, do that in just a moment here. The Armenian Studies Program organizes uh, multiple events during the semester, and I wanted to introduce you to our next event, which is going to take place on Thursday, February the 17th. Uh, the international lawyer, Karni Kerkonyan, is going to present a, a very interesting presentation on Armenia versus Azerbaijan in the International Court of Justice, uh, which is the recent case brought under the International Convention against all forms of racial discrimination. So Karni Kerkonyan was one of the uh, legal representatives for Armenia at this case, and he will talk about the, the background of the case, uh, how it was brought to the court, and what has taken place uh, already in that event. This will take place on Thursday, February the 17th uh, through Zoom res registration and the registration link is there uh, for you. Also on Friday, March 4th, uh, the Armenian Studies Program and the Philip Lorenz Keyboard Concert Series present the Komidas Trio. This is Michael Krikorian on the piano, Arusyak Baltayan on violin and Gadik Terzian on the cello and they'll be performing in concert live at Fresno State on Friday, March the 4th at 7.30 p.m. And you need to purchase tickets for that. And you can do that through the keyboardconcerts.com uh, website. All of our events are posted on Facebook. If you follow us on Facebook or on the Armenian Studies Program website, you can see all of the upcoming events uh, that are taking place through the Armenian Studies Program. And we have quite a few that are uh, coming up even more in March and, and in April. So it's gonna be a full semester of, uh, of materials that we're gonna be covering. So tonight I would like to introduce our uh, guest speaker, Dr. Vartan Matiosian, a historian and literary, literary scholar who has been the executive director of the Eastern Prelacy of the Armenian Church in New York in 2019. Uh, he received his doctorate degree uh, from the Institute of History of the National Academy of Sciences of Armenia in 2006. He has uh, published extensively in multiple languages, including Armenian, Spanish, and English, including the translation of almost two dozen books and the editing of 25 volumes, as well as five books that he has authored in Armenian, one in Spanish, and two in English. I'm happy to say that uh, I am working with uh, Dr. Matiosian and with his colleague Arzvi Bakhchinyan to publish uh, very soon a new book in the Armenian series of the press at California State University, Fresno. And the title of that new work is Armenian Woman of the World, The Life and Work of Armin Ohanian, the Dancer of Shamacha. And this is a very interesting uh, story uh, about the Dancer of Shamacha. And I think that Dr. Matiosian will be back with us probably later in the semester along with Ardsby to discuss that, that book, which will probably be published uh, within a couple of months. So tonight's lecture is a very interesting uh, presentation and lecture, the title of which is What's in a Name, Language, the Politics of the Armenian Genocide, and Meds Yeren. And the title is based actually on a, the most recent book that Dr. Matiosian published, which is called The Politics of Naming the Armenian Genocide, Language, History, and Meds Yeren. And that word, which is kind of tough to say in Armenian, Meds Yeren, actually is translated as great crime. And what uh, Dr. Matiosian does in the book and what he's gonna discuss tonight with us is how that concept, how that word came about, the, the word meds yeren, and how it came to be used uh, to discuss the Armenian genocide. More importantly, he will argue that the subject has been omitted and misinterpreted 
in historiography. And his presentation will also make reference to the uh, history of that word and its use by such people as particularly Pope John Paul II, uh, the last four presidents of the United States, and also the 2008 apology campaign by a group of Turkish intellectuals. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome our speaker, Dr. Vartan Matiosian. Welcome, Dr. Matiosian. Thank you, Barlow, for that presentation. And thank you for having me in the series of the Armenia Studies program. I'm glad to be there. I have never there in a, in a virtual sense. I have never been to Fresno, but I hope one day that will happen. So this is an opportunity to be closer to Fresno, even if throughout the internet. Um, let's start by saying that, as uh, Barlow mentioned, the, the talk is based on my uh, last book, which has been out since October, published by I.B. Torres. Uh, and this is a book that took me uh, about 10 years to complete. Uh, it started as a very simple project, as a series of articles which were published in the Armenian Weekly in 2012 and 2013, but I would say that when I was write, when I was publishing the first of those articles, I already I had the idea that those articles should become a book. And at first, I thought that it would be just you know turning the articles, making some little dust up here and there, and it would the book would be ready. And then I re, and then uh, material started to come up more and more and more information. And uh, in the end, this became a 10 year work as it stands uh, to, the, to the reader today. Um, so, uh, Barlow, if you can start uh, sharing, thank you. So you have here the cover of the book and also the main picture that uh, is on the cover. Um, I will, I will, uh, during the presentation, I will go back to the picture to explain what it, what it means in the context of the book itself. So uh, next one, uh, Barlow, please. So um, Medjiren is a, is a word, or two words actually, uh, Med meaning great for those who don't know Armenian, and uh, that's not a problem, of course, the translation of that word. The problem is the word Iran itself. And this is a, 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 what I'm going to do here is to give a very, a very short genealogy of the word, how the word came up and what it means. And of course, uh, there is no space to try to explain or make the uh, fundamentals of how uh, how the, the language part is done, and I'm not going to, uh, to bore you to death with uh, linguistic explanations. But uh, let's start from saying that the word is already attested in the fifth century in the Armenian translation of the Bible. And uh, it has, since then, it has been all over the place until uh, the, 20, the 21st century, indeed. So we are talking about a word which belongs to the uh, Indo-European core of the Armenian language. As you, is, as you see here on the slide, uh, it comes from a Proto-Indo-European root. As you know, uh, all Indo-European language, languages are theorized to be the descendants of a mother Indo-European or Proto-Indo-European uh, language, which is a reconstructed language. Not that there is a single word uh, preserved in that language, but it's, uh, it has been reconstructed through the work of uh, linguists uh, working backwards from the modern and ancient languages towards getting the uh, common roots that should have been the source for the words as we know them today. So in this particular case, uh, the most accepted etymology of the word Yerem is uh, uh, from a Proto-Indo-European root, El, which means to destroy, meant to destroy, to spoil. And uh, this uh, root uh, evolved into the, uh, in the end to the Armenian, classical Armenian word, Yel, Yel-Ern, 
which is what we pronounce now ERM. And as you see there, it's the root L turned into year in the end with two Armenian suffixes, year and na. Um, in both, in uh, both cases, in this case, as you will see, uh, there is uh, the, the letter uh, R is a strong R like uh, carro in Spanish. Uh, and this is an important distinction. So, so uh, in the vocabulary of, uh, cl of classical Armenian, the meaning of the word, the main, the first uh, and essential meaning of the word is evil and then crime. Uh, parallel to this, uh, to this, uh, the word Yerem, uh, this word Yerem, uh, there was another root, another uh, close sounding uh, root, which was the classical Armenian word uh, Yerar, written with a, a soft uh, R, as in Spanish caro. Uh, which actually evolved to, to give a root which has not been preserved, which is Yerer, which only appears in several, uh, in several derived words, such as, for instance, Yereragan, which means lamentable. So uh, that uh, word Yerar meant uh, lament, lament or mourning in classical Armenian and came from another Proto-European root also L or all, which was a, an onomatopoeic sound of lamentation, uh, from which we have as the closest example, the English word elegy, which actually derives from a Greek word, uh, but the root is precise, precisely that same L as a sound of lamentation. These two, these two words, yerer and yerer, which are wrote differently, as as I uh, as I said a moment uh, before, uh, they they are different one from the other. The problem comes when uh, people tend to identify both. Uh, next, Paulo. Uh, so what happened? It happened that uh, in the 19th century, uh, three uh, learned Mechitarist uh, monks from the congregation in Vienna, in Venezia, in Venice, uh, published the non haigazian Levi Pararan, the New Haigazian Language Dictionary, in two volumes in 1836-37. Actually, two of them had already uh, passed away, but at that time it was the third, Molodich Avkerian, who took care of publishing the, this uh, dictionary, which is the fundamental dictionary for classical Armenian there is a, a mother source for anyone who wants to enter uh, into classical Armenian and it collected uh, most of the uh, vocabulary of classical Armenian and there the definition of uh, Yerem uh, included, ex uh, included uh, also equalized the word Yerem so the, the meaning of both words were equalized. And in this sense, uh, Yeren acquired the, 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 the meaning of lament and mourning. Both meanings were conflated and with, with uh, both words together. So from this conflation, in my, in my opinion, after looking into this quite thoroughly, uh, from this conflation came the actual con uh, confusion of both meanings, which was the source for, uh, for what I, I call the interpretive denial of the word in the, uh, the at the beginning of the present century. Next, please. So this is the, in, the, in basics, what was the meaning of the word uh, Yerer, Yerer? Uh, in classical Armenian until uh, the end of the 19th century. Now, uh, what is important here is to, and I'm, again, I'm uh, simplifying indeed what uh, I have presented in my book, especially in the first part of the book, uh, is what Yeren meant before and after 1915. And to understand the meaning, when I say that uh, Yerem in uh, by 1915 meant crime, as I 
uh, as you see in the slide, we need to look at uh, uh, derived and compound words and the series of derived and compound words uh, from here. You have, you have here six other words, which we can discuss right now. First, we have Yeher Nagan, is an adjective, which means criminal, uh, basically related to the crime. And then we have Yeher Nakon, which uh, literally means the one who does or uh, perpetrates a Yeher, which means criminal. Uh, and it's used both as a noun and an adjective. And then we have uh, several uh, nouns. Yegerna Kordutyun, meaning crime, criminal act, execution of the crime. Yegerna Pan, meaning criminologist. Yegerna Port, criminal attempt. And Yegerna Tad Adyan, this is the most interesting one. Yegerna Tad Adyan means criminal court. And uh, we come back to this point. If all six words have the meaning of uh, related to crime, and you can double check that with uh, any dictionary you want. Uh, what, what can error mean if not crime? Can you think of a tragical or uh, lamenting court? Can you think of a catastrophic, catastrophic court? No, of course not, because a Yeher Natad Adyan means a court that judges a crime, so a criminal court. So moving backwards, when we have the derivations of Yerel, meaning uh, it mean, means related to crime, it is clear that the primary mean of Yerel is, uh, is crime too. You can find any kind of secondary uh, meanings if you want, but they don't deter from the fact that what we may consider and we have to consider when we say is what it, what the word means primarily for any uh, for any person knowing the language, when he or she hears this word, what's the meaning that comes to his mind? And that meaning prim primarily is crime. So medieval basically meant uh, me uh, me a great crime before and after 1915, and I have shown this exhaustively by many examples. Uh, I have to add here that uh, in, in the book, I have relied mostly on translations, meaning that I have tried, I have, uh, uh, tried to find uh, as many, as many uh, possible uh, texts in Armenian and their translations into uh, foreign languages, and also foreign texts, uh, texts in English or in French, and their translation in Armenian at the, at the same time. So I'm giving the contemporary meaning of the, the word uh, in, and not the meaning that I would uh, uh, I, uh, ascribe to the word. Uh, of course, I am not going to give here any examples. Uh, those who are interested, can re I, I refer them to the book to look into that information. Uh, next, uh, follow please. So, right before and after 1915, the, mean, the meaning of uh, Yeren is crime or heinous crime. Uh, which we don't have a single word to say heinous crime in English, but we have the word uh, for fair in French, which means exactly, which is translated into English exactly as heinous crime. And we have here an example from the 1905 dictionary by Papazi, an Armenian English dictionary, when you see the word Yeren in between uh, parentheses, Bojir, as a synonymous word to uh, Yeren, meaning and noun crime. And the interesting point is that after 1915, another meaning was added to the word, which is the meaning massacre, sometime between 1915 and 1965. And most interestingly, this, uh, this uh, um, image which you see, I, just, I found, I, ha I, had, I had theorized that it was sometime between 1915 and 1965, uh, without being able to give an actual date, this, uh, this image gives a hint. This is a, a, a monthly published in Beirut in 1939, 1944, called Haikir. This is the first issue, which con contains uh, a, dedica a, dedica a dedicacy to the, to the um, writers who were 
killed during the genocide. And interestingly, this, uh, this um, dedication was made in Armenian. Uh, there was a French translation. And while the, uh, the Armenian uh, and the English, excuse me, the French uh, translation says, to the eternal memory of the uh, writers, martyrs of the great massacres of Armenia, where the uh, Armenian uses medieval uh, in the, uh, instead of great, grand, uh, great massacres, which is grand massacre in French. So already in 1939, we have uh, a, an explicit mention of great massacres long before 1965. And it's possible that there are other mentions before 1939, but I have not been able to, found, uh, to find those. I have theorized about a couple of possible translations of the Iran mini massacre before, I mean, uh, shortly after 1915, but it's not absolutely clear that. But this is an explicit case, which I am glad to, to bring here for the first time. Next, please. So in 1965, we find that Medjeren is definitely translated as both great massacre or great massacres and genocide of the Armenians. And we have here a very interesting example from a collection of uh, pamphlets which were published by the Yerevni Hisunam Yagigetoran Hansahum, the Central Committee for the 50th anniversary of Yerevan, translating from Armenian, which was uh, based in, uh, in Boston. At the Heidenic Weekly, at the Heidenic uh, building there, and uh, uh, on the uh, left side you see the uh, the only pamphlet in Armenia that was published, uh, the number of the Armenians by Yevvan Khatanasian, and which we, which it says that it is a publication of the 50th anniversary, the committee for the 50th anniversary of the year. Now the English pamphlets have two different versions. You find on your left, the first pamphlet published, which was a publication of the commemorative committee on the 50th anniversary of the Turkish massacre of the Armenians, massacres of the Armenians. But a later pamphlet published, uh, uh, the fifth published, uh, pamphlet published in the same year was by the commemorative committee on the 50th anniversary of the Turkish genocide of the Armenians which means that the committee, which was called, uh, which had the name uh, Yerel in its uh, composition, in English, it had first the name, uh, the use um, massacres, and then it used genocide. So both words are were already interchangeably used by 1965. And the translation of Yerel continues for a few years as massacres, but, uh, Slowly and then more uh, quickly, it started to become that translation of Yerevan started to become genocide. Next, please. And uh, here you have a couple of uh, Cinderella stamps, uh, also published in 1965, where you see uh, 50th anniversary of the Armenian Yerevan uh, in Armenian and 50th anniversary of Turkish genocide of the Armenians in English. And again, genocide on the other one. Uh, the, the one at the top was published here in the States, the one at the bottom in the Lebanon. Next, please. And now we are closer to you because the, as you, every, everybody who lives in Fresno knows or should know, Soho Montelirian's grave is uh, uh, at the uh, Armenian Cemetery in Fresno. And you have here the bilingual inscription on the, on the uh, tomb tombstone. And you see here in the Armenian version that uh, I have given the translation there where it, the, the word Tseraspan, genocide there is used. And it, uh, it says that Talat Pasha, that uh, is the individual mainly as the genocide there, is the individual mainly responsible for the one and a half million Armenian martyrs of the April year, the April year of 1915. And the English inscription it says, as you can see, a principal Turkish perpetrator of the Armenian genocide of 1915. So, as you, as you see there, Yeren is in Armenian and genocide is in English. And you can be absolutely sure that uh, whoever uh, wrote the text in Armenian knew the word Tseraspanutyun, 
because they used it in the text as uh, in the use it as Teraspan, but they prefer to use the expression Abelian Yerem and translate it into English as Armenian genocide. Uh, and the reason is very simple. The reason is that Yerem in different forms, Abelian Yerem, Mez Yerem, or Yerem alone, is the actual name of the event. And uh, it, the name of the event is not Armenian genocide, and this is an argument that I make strongly in the book, but genocide being a legal term is the legal definition of what happened, not the name of what happened. Next, please. So, we have the legal word genocide combined with the adjective Armenian, uh, giving us the phrase, as we see, say, uh, saw before, the phrase Turkish genocide of the Armenians, which was later shortened to genocide of the Armenians without Turkish, and then genocide of Armenians, and finally to Armenian genocide for the sake of abbreviation. And in the, uh, over the years, Armenian genocide was capitalized because uh, there was the assumption that a capitalization would bolster the prospects of recognition. And this is how the capitalized name Armenian Genocide was kind of adopted as, the, as a proper name for what happened. But actually, the proper name of what happened is not Armenian Genocide. The pro I'm talking about the proper name. I'm not, not talking about, again, the, uh, what the legal definition. In the same way that the proper name for the Jewish Genocide is Shoah, which literally means catastrophe and has been translated as Holocaust. And the proper name of the Ukrainian genocide is Holodomor, which means Great Famine. The proper name of the Armenian genocide is Medierem, which literally means great heinous, if you want it, heinous crime, at least until 1945. And after 1945, you could apply great genocide as the translation. Of course, you can't use uh, you can't use genocide to translate Medierem when the use of the word is from a text, for instance, uh, prior to 1945. So, if, as we all know, Tseras Panutyun is the Aramean word for genocide, and we see in a couple of examples, and we see a few more, that Yerem is synonym to Tseras Panutyun, then Yerem is an Aramean word for genocide too. And this is an argument that you can uh, find very well. It's very compelling if you look, first of all, in the, in, into the language, you look into dictionaries, you look into literary terms, you look in texts, and uh, you, you move through the use of the language and the evolution of the language throughout time during the 20th century. Next, please. So here, in, in the 1970s and 1980s, the translation genocide for Yeren started to get in, get in traction. And we have a nice example in the first uh, inscription on a genocide memorial in the United States where the word Yeren was used with a translation. This is in Niagara Falls in the state of New York, 1980. Uh, as you see in the inscription in Armenian says, Khachkari i Hishadak Hazar Dasni Yerani Haina Hadagats, meaning Khachkari in memoriam of the Mart Armenian martyrs of the 1915 Yerem. And in English, you see in memoriam Armenian martyrs of the 1915 genocide. Again, people know what the word, the legal term for genocide is, Teraspanutun. But they use Yerem too, and they translate it as genocide. This means something. This means that people, they know their language and use their language as they see fit. Next. This is uh, a newspaper ad from 1978 uh, uh, for uh, hockey Yankees and the uh, commemoration that was done at the Cathedral of St. Patrick in New York, organized by the Eastern Prelacy, and you see they are the Armenian text at the top and the English at the bottom, and the English correspond exactly to the Armenian, where the English says Armenian genocide April 1915. The Armenian says Abriyan Yerem, again, April Yerem, again. Next, please. 
And now we come to the picture which we have here. And I'm glad to say that uh, this I, I obtained this picture through the courtesy of uh, Dr. Harutun Marutian, who I believe uh, is in the audience. Uh, the director of the Armenian Genocide Museum Institute of uh, Yerevan. So this picture corresponds to the uh, commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the genocide in Armenia in 1990. Uh, and you see here uh, a miniature reconstruction of the, of the monument of Zirnagaper, which is being carried to Zirnagaper as a sort of floral, floral offer. But uh, again, as a mini monument, which is op been offered to the big monument. And as you see uh, on the left side, you see on the uh, on the uh, shorter part of the monument, 1915, and the dates of the four massacres of 1896, the Amidia massacres, the uh, Adana massacres of 1909, the 1988 massacres of Sugai, and the 1990 massacres of Baku. And on the right, you see the word genocide on the left, and the word Yeren on the right. And again, people in Armenia knew what the word Seras Panutun, and knew, they knew the uh, long word genocide from Russian, but they used Yeren again. Yeren 75 and genocide, left and right. Next, please. This is a map published in 2015 on the 100th anniversary. You see perfectly what uh, printed there, Hayot Medjerne, the Armenian uh, Medjerne on the left, and Armenian genocide on the right. Again, it doesn't say Hayot Seraspanitun. It says Hayot Medjerne. Next. Finally, uh, an a sample from the uh, website of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, this is a um, screenshot taken of September in September 2018. You see here a chapter dedicated uh, to cultural genocide, where it says cultural genocide in English and Mushagutain Yerer in Armenian. And the word Tseras Panutun used throughout the text. You can see the uh, word in the second uh, line in, uh, in English when it says Askain Mushagutain Tseras Panutun. And in English, indeed, you, say, you see cultural uh, uh, genocide. So uh, again, uh, it means something when you call with cultural genocide in Armenia, you call it Mushabutain Yerer. Next, please. Now, let's, uh, let's understand the following. Uh, we have a, a relationship between the victimizer and the victim, which is a relation of cause and effect, where the victimizer performs the action. For example, deporta a deportation. And uh, there is a use of active verbs to this effect. For instance, they execute the deportation, they perpetrate the deportation. And uh, this, uh, this action effects an, uh, has an effect of agency, for instance, a felony or a genocide on the victim. So when you commit, let's say, a murder, it's an action which has an agency of a crime on the, or a felony in American parlance on the victim. The victim, whether it's a survivor or not, it, it's, uh, it's irrelevant for the case. The, uh, from the side of the victim, there is a reflection of the reaction toward the action of the victimizer with words like tragedy, calamity, or catastrophe, which are expressed through passive verbs. For example, happen to be felt. So we hear all the time the uh, tragedy that befell the, the Armenian people, or the catastrophe that happened to the Armenians. You never use uh, an active verb with catastrophe or calamity or tragedy because those are words that lack any agency. They are not actions. They don't, uh, they don't show you the, what the victimizer did, but what the vic how the victim sees the action of the victimizer on. So action is, of course, different from reaction. And we have here cause. Yerer, a crime, which is committed, Kordovi. And the effect is a catastrophe, which is the word Ahed in Armenian, which happens, Gbadahi. There is no Ahed, which is Kordovas. You don't find the word Ahed Kordovetsav in Armenian. You don't find the word 
you may find the word Yerena but it's not a proper, even a proper use of uh, Yerena. Well, I mean, a, a, a verb that should be used with Yerena, I believe. Uh, so when you convert Yerena into calamity, disaster, or catastrophe, you are eliminating the cause, meaning the crime, and you are turning the world into a, a passive world which lacks any agency. And this is exactly what happened again in the at the beginning of the 21st century. Next, please. So here again, I want to give you a very fast example from the TV. So in the show Law and Order Organized Crime, there was an episode in May where a black young man was attacked by a, who was coming out of a music store during a, a black demonstration nearby. Two running policemen engage and tackle him, and when he tries to reach his phone, one of the policemen step on his right hand and crash. And in the next episode, uh, Detective Elliot Sabler meets uh, the, the mother of this black young man and says, I'm sorry for what happened to your son. And the mother replies, it didn't happen to him, it was done to him. So here we can see a clear example of the difference between what you do and what happens. When you do it, you are actively per, uh, committing something. When something happens, there is no one, there may be no one doing this. It's just something that happens out of the blue. It could be, um, let's say, an earthquake and a tragedy happens, but there is no one to be responsible for what happened. Next, please. So, uh, the secondary meaning calamity or catastrophe, because there was a news of course, of the word uh, Yeren as calamity or catastrophe derived from that uh, conflation that I mentioned before between Yeren and Yerer, was picked up in the 2000s as a tool for interpretive denial. And the translations, great calamity and great catastrophe were uncritically accepted by Armenians leading to self-denial. Because when you accept the translations that came from uh, non-Armenian sources and you accept them, you are denying yourself, you are denying your own language, you are denying what you know about the language and accepting what others tell you that, that your language means. So the interesting thing is that I was unable to find any bilingual dictionary that, that had calamity or catastrophe as primary or secondary meaning of year between 1915 and 2009. So where did they got, they, they get, uh, the meaning calamity of catastrophe, how you can justify that meaning when there is no bilingual dictionary to prove the point. And on the other hand, interestingly, as a result of that use, continuous use of Yerena genocide from the 70s and 80s, we come up with, uh, we find 11 bilingual dictionaries where Yeren was translated as genocide in different languages between 1995 and 2014. And of course, I have the list of those dictionaries in the book. Next, please. Now let's go to those examples of, uh, as I said, uh, of um, denial uh, that happened in the early uh, in the early 21st century. Well, we have the first in the first case, uh, Pope John Paul II use of Medieval. And, but first, let me remind you that in November 2000, when uh, Catholicos of all Armenians carried in the second visit to the Vatican, uh, the Pope and the Catholicos signed a joint statement where they declared, for both of us, the 20th century was marked by extreme violence. The Armenian genocide which began the century was a product of horror that would follow. And when John Paul II in September 2001 visited Armenia, on the 70th anniversary of the uh, adoption of Christianism and uh, Christianity as uh, official religion, he went to give a prayer at the memorial of Zizan Agapet. And because as a, uh, as a uh, head of state, he had already recognized the genocide with the declaration the year before, he had all the right to be the head of the church for one day and give a prayer and use Medjerem in a prayer. Why Medjerem? Because the monument in Zizanagapel was called Medjerem in Husharzan, Hushar, a memorial of the Medjerem. And when he says 
Listen, O Lord, to the lament that rises from this place, to the call of, of the dead from the depths of the Mediterranean. He's talking about the, uh, the monument where you stand in. Those who have been there know what I'm talking about. And he's uh, symbolizing what, uh, the, what the monument means in the prayer. But he had all the right to use Mediterranean and not necessarily Terras Panicum in his prayer because it was in the end a religious a religious text uh, and of course uh, uh, hell, uh, hell broke loose uh, after this prayer and uh, in the um, in the mainstream press everybody started talking about uh, uh, the pope trying to uh, avoid using genocide etc etc he has uh, some some sources of some uh, agencies mentioned the previous the previous statement but of course they said why he's using measure now uh, interestingly uh, and this happened only at the time uh, some uh, some uh, uh, some press agencies and some newspapers mentioned uh, that Iran meant uh, crime or great crime or great evil which was the translation favor by the Vatican, they also mentioned that Armenians uh, mean genocide by using that, and this didn't happen. Didn't be, it wouldn't happen. It would happen ten years later. This happened only at the time in 2001. But interestingly, the next day, uh, John Paul II and the Catholicos Caritas the second day signed another joint statement where uh, uh, the main sentence said that the extermination of a million of and a half Armenian Christians in what is generally referred to as the first genocide of the 20th century. So the interesting point is that uh, the use of Medjugorje by uh, John Paul II uh, kind of chased him over the years. And in two, uh, after 2009, 2010, especially when Barack Obama started using Medjugorje. Uh, there were Armenian pundits who went back to what John Paul had said in 2001, uh, taking out from the whole context of his use of genocide twice in two statements, which were actually political statements and not prayers. Uh, so you see here that how we start uh, this process of interpretive denial by changing the meaning of the words and accommodating the meaning of the words uh, in the, in the, uh, as it seems, seems to be. Next, please. After John Paul II, and I'm skipping other examples, uh, we have the Turkish Apology Campaign statement in December 2008, where they, uh, they spoke about the denial of the great catastrophe that the Ottoman Armenians were subjected to in 1915. And the word great catastrophe in the English text, it appeared in 11 languages. It was translated, translated into Turkish as Buyut Felaket, which means great, great disaster or great catastrophe. And the, in Armenian as Medjerel. And nobody stood up and was, uh, there was a couple of timid examples of saying that yes, Medjerel is an uh, old use of, uh, that Armenians had, but nobody stood up and told the uh, Turkish intellectuals that you know uh, actually we know a little bit more Armenian that you know and the uh, Medjerian is not great catastrophe. Next please. Uh, now we have the examples from the last uh, American president started with uh, George W. Bush who in uh, 2003 and 2005 used great calamity which was it wasn't mentioned by him but it was the uh, uh, intent to be the translation of a translation of Medjugorje, and we have uh, proof of that uh, uh, that he meant that actually what Medjugorje, the original word behind this great calamity, used. And then we have the use, the first use by President Barack Obama in 2009. Uh, uh, he would use Medjugorje for a total of 17 times during his eight years. Uh, and then we have finally, uh, after Bush, Obama, and Trump, finally President Joe Biden in uh, April 2021, as you know, he uh, recognized the genocide using genocide twice. Uh, 
And he mentioned uh, in the first paragraph of his statement of last year, he said, each year on this day, we remember the lives of all those who died in the Ottoman Armenian era, Armenian genocide. And interestingly, he, uh, he still used, we honor the victims of the Medjerem so that the horrors of what happened are never lost to history. So you may notice there that he used genocide in a lower case, Armenian genocide, not as a, as a, a proper name, but he used Medjerem as the proper name of the genocide. And nobody complained, fortunately, why he had used Medjerem. Next, please. This is an interesting point. This is the last uh, uh, paragraph, uh, just as a curiosity. Uh, some of the paragraphs of Obama's uh, last statement in April 2016. Uh, and you can see in blue all those sentences because the uh, degeneration that came up from the use of major got to the point that Obama's uh, statements in the last and uh, in the last years, especially 2000. 12 to 2014, they are, were basically a cut and paste uh, from the previous year. And in 2015, he made a fundamental revamp of what he wrote. And in 2016, it was again mostly pasted from the previous year. But interestingly, uh, what he wrote in 2016, the blue parts, you can see them practically plagiarized in the first uh, statement of Donald Trump in 2000, April 2017, which shows you to what extent uh, the, the use of the, and the abuse of the, of the words, can, to how low the abuse of the words can go, that uh, people can start not only cutting and pasting, but also plagiarizing each other. Next, please. So I want to, end this conversation with a couple of uh, what if scenarios uh, to think about what we have uh, talked before and what we see here. You see here the first, again, the text of the first statement by President Barack Obama. And imagine if someone had come out uh, from our uh, pundits, our lobbying organizations, etc., etc., and told Barack Obama, you know, uh, med when you say Medjerem, that means great genocide. Every time you say Medjerem, it means great genocide. Imagine if, if there had been a child who had told the emperor that the emperor was naked. It, was, it, had, it could have been a real uh, blow. And at least, of course, we wouldn't have uh, uh, ensured that the next year Obama would have used genocide. But at least we, have, we would have avoided uh, the spectacle of having uh, the word Medjerem used year after year and bastardized in its meaning as great calamity, great catastrophe, great tragedy, year after year, and with nobody standing up, with very few exceptions, standing up to say that, you know, this is absolutely wrong. Or if not great genocide, at least great crime but not even that. So Obama used 17 times, as I said, Medjerem. And interestingly, in the first, in the first uh, years, and mostly during the uh, eight years actually, he had a template where you see eight times, the phrases in yellow were used eight times, those in red were used six times, and those in purple five times. And this was the main template where he, first of all, he referred to his own view that he had uh, used uh, the word genocide. He had recognized the genocide when he wasn't president, and that the Medjerem was on one of the worst, worst atrocities. And I'll go back to that in one second. And uh, that he wanted the achievement of full, full frank, and just acknowledgement uh, of the facts. And that uh, what he wanted was tacitly directed to the side that didn't recognize the facts that didn't have a full frank and just acknowledgement. So there was, there was a, imagine if this, this template combined with the translation Medjerem would have done for recognition of the genocide if it had been done at the proper time. Next please. Now, thinking aloud, most of you should know or 
know, have heard the phrase that says that Uruguay was the first country to recognize the Armenian genocide. And uh, it is true, it has been said many times and Uruguay definitely recognized the genocide in 1965 uh, with a law which was uh, approved on and signed on April 23, 1965 for the commemoration of April 24 of that year. And this law was, uh, after that year, a new law in 2004 came up for every April 24. So uh, the exposition of motives of this law mentions the word genocide four times, but the only mention to the crime that appears in that law of 1965 is the, is the following text. The, next, the article first, the next April 24 is declared day of remembrance for the Armenian martyrs in a homage of the members of that nationality assassinated in 1915. The only word that shows a crime in this law is the word assassinated. There is no word genocide in the text of the law. There is in the text of the exposition of motives, but the exposition of motives is not part of any law. This is interesting, but again, we all agree that Uruguay was the first country to recognize the Armenian genocide because later there were many examples of, uh, example of Uruguayan diplomacy and politicians mention, and presidents mentioning the genocide by its name, by, uh, with its legal term. So then we have the president of the United States did not recognize the Armenian genocide, you know, when we talked about um, especially about Obama. And we have here an example from his last uh, statement in 2016, when he started, the first sentence started saying that, this year we mark the centennial of the medieval, the first mass atrocity of the 20th century. Beginning in 1915, the Armenian people of the Ottoman Empire were deported, massacred, and marched to their death. Their culture and heritage in their ancient homeland were erased. First, I uh, go from, uh, from the uh, back to the top and say it first. Their culture and heritage in their ancient homeland were erased. Even though cultural genocide is not a recognized category uh, by the UN uh, Convention, this is the definition of uh, cultural genocide. That sentence, their culture and heritage in their ancient homeland were erased. The Armenian people of the Ottoman Empire were deported, massacred, and marched to their death. Deport deportation is a category in the uh, Roman statute, uh, statute of the International Court. is a, one, of the, um, one of the words as part of crimes against humanity. And march to their death is also uh, meant to be extermination. And the combination of deportation and extermination with an intent is genocide. Even though, of course, Obama, as his predecessors, he used a passive voice, so he didn't, in this sentence at least, he didn't disclose who, uh, who were those who had deported, massacred, and marched the Armenians to their death. And then we, let me go to the first sentence. This year we marked the centennial of the Medellin, the first mass atrocity of the 20th century. At the time, I remember perfectly that uh, our uh, pundits in the Armenian press, they all marked, again, the use of the word atrocities, how Obama reduces all what happened to simply atrocities, but they didn't notice that mass atrocity, uh, the combination of mass and atrocity, and atrocity alone is no longer the old use of atrocities that we know from 1915. Now it has a legal content. And Legal experts have been developing this over the past two decades. And uh, there was a national atrocity, uh, an atrocity prevention board established in 2012 at the National Security Council, especially to prevent uh, genocides and uh, crimes against humanity and other uh, kinds of uh, crimes. And in 2018, the Congress passed the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act, where there is a, a clause at the end, a note, 
which says, of course, the first the term, what the term genocide means, but the second is that the term atrocities means war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. So when Obama spoke about mass atrocity, he wasn't talking about a, uh, a common atrocity. He was talking about something that encompassed genocide too. But this is something that we didn't realize at the time again, because we were too, too very invested into using genocide or not. And I am going to stop here and just, first of all, thank you for your attention. I will be ready to answer your questions if there is any. Thanks again. Thank you, uh, Dr. Matiosian. Uh, we're now going to uh, be taking uh, questions. So would you please use the uh, chat function in the, um, in the Zoom to ask your questions? Uh, and then we'll be reading some of them and then we'll give opportunity for uh, Dr. Matiosian to respond to that. While you're doing that, I, I have a question that uh, was thinking about the use of uh, the terms either medzierern or genocide as you were mentioning in the presidents, uh, the various presidents, I'm wondering if you had a chance to uh, analyze what the Turkish response to that was. In other words, was there any official Turkish response that was different between when they saw that the term medzierern was used or the term genocide, or did it, did it really matter to the Turkish government, sort of the official reaction to that? Or did you get a chance to look at that? Um, as much as my very basic knowledge of Turkish allowed me, uh, I tried to look into that. There were a few cases where, for instance, Ahmad Davutoglu reacted to that. Uh, but the most interesting case came after the fact. In 2019, uh, Erdogan, president, the president of Turkey, Erdogan, went, we went up with uh, one of his, uh, you know, uh, usual rants about uh, the Armenian genocide, saying that it wasn't the genocide, it wasn't the massacre, it wasn't uh, uh, a catastrophe. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't the Mediterranean meaning in in in, the, in, the, in Turkish uh, in Turkish vocabulary, but it was uh, an event that happened, something that happened. So in a sense, he denied even the use of um, of great disaster that it was, it became so common in the uh, Turkish press, starting with the um, apology campaign. Because, you know, before the apology campaign, uh, the, even though the Turkish diplomatic circles knew about Medzieren, what, uh, I mean, the, the use of the word, and they even, one, in one time, as I mentioned in my book, protested saying that Medzieren, that the use of Iran in a monument in Stuttgart in Germany was meant to say genocide. Um, but the use, the general use of the word in the Turkish press didn't, didn't come up until uh, after 2008, 2009. So it has been very, very commonly used, but Erdogan even denied that as a, a possible uh, denomination. I mean, uh, he didn't even allow himself to say that it was a tragedy in his palace. Okay, and make sure to, uh, again, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and put that in the uh, chat area. Um, and I'll go ahead and ask another question while we're waiting for some more questions. So when the presidents of the United States use medzieren uh, rather than genocide, they must intentionally have used that word instead of the word genocide. So. You, the argument would be then, did they really recognize it or not? Or did they unintentionally recognize it simply because, as you've explained, Medzieren is really genocide? Well, in a sense, in a sense, I would say that they unintentionally did. I mean, basically, we can say Obama and Trump because they were the two of them who used Medzieren without using genocide. But of course, it wasn't uh, their intention. That's why, it's, uh, as you will say, it, it was unintentional. But of course, nobody, nobody was there to point that out. My argument is that if at least someone had come up, there had been a strong, a strong reaction to the use of Medzieren in 2009, 
most likely you, you have you would have shown you know that you were wrong and you unintentionally recognized the genocide and the next year at least the next statement wouldn't have had the word major and there and the word wouldn't have been bastardized as it was over the past 10 years where the use of the word uh, was um, was uh, practically um, changed over those years and uh, calamity and uh, uh, catastrophe went rampant there in the youth by people who didn't even know Armenian to justify their youth. And my argument is that, that we as Armenians, we are the owners of our language. And if we are the owners of our language, so we are the ones who say what our words mean. And we, we shouldn't be uh, imposed the meanings of the of the, of the lang of our words by outsiders, which is what happened, I believe strongly in this case. And I'm gonna uh, put in the chat, everyone, uh, the name of his new book. So you can take a look at it and take a look at some more of what uh, Dr. Matiosin's uh, arguments are and what he's, he's talked about. I wanna thank you very much for your presentation. It was a fascinating uh, look into the use of the words medzieren and how that developed and and really the the political ramifications of that as well so thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening dr matiosian thank you barlo for this opportunity again and uh, i hope to be uh, sometime again with you with you and uh, thank you again to all present for uh, being there and uh, listening patiently to my explanation Thank you. And uh, for all our audience, I want to invite you to join us on February the 17th for uh, our next uh, presentation, which will be on the International Court of Justice 